kind of the, the uh, framework of my thoughts is about how uh, I was talking about uh, recently about um, reproved by our own backslidings, that sort of thing. So backsliding is sort of slipping back from something you used to, a position you used to have or whatever. So, so maybe we'll address what that position is and call it like the first love. And nothing new here, but um, it's just part of my meditations and everything. So I'm not sure how it will unfold. But uh, we're, we're in a, uh, a press to return. And I could be, I guess, return to her first love. I heard another preacher say it uh, recently that you've lost your first love. And I still remember the first time I, I uh, one time I had said that. It was Brother Stair, actually. Uh, Brother Stair was preaching, and he was referring to the scripture. And I anticipated it and said it before I preached it. And I said, yeah, you lost your first love. And he said, no, <laughs> you left it. <laughs> so that's a, good, uh, that's a good distinction. So I've always remembered that moment. From that moment on, I made sure that whenever I <laughs> meditated on the first love, we didn't lose it, we left it. Right? So that's, that's an important distinction. So we return, right? Return to the Most High. We'll cover some various principles in all of this. But when you are uh, a Christian, if you're one, like the Bible says, that God has foreknown... Uh, predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son, the, to them that He foreknew them, did He also predestinate? Predestined, foreknown, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, and God said this before the children were born. They didn't have a chance to do good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works. So it's the election of God. It's the work of God. It's the decision of God. It's the ordinance of God. It's the preordinance of God. Known to God are all His works. And some of this takes the form of being like, God knows us so well, He knows how to frame circumstances around us to cause us to approach, right? Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causes to approach. Because there's none that seek after God. No, not one. They are all together unprofitable. They have all gone out of the way. Nobody seeks God. You don't seek God. I don't seek God. Nobody seeks God unless God decides to intervene or interject or get involved and cause you to, con to change your consideration of things. But God doesn't do that as a direct imposition on your will. He does it externally through circumstances, through afflictions. To give your will the opportunity to come forth of itself. This is a very important part of worship. Jesus said, the earth brings forth fruit of itself. It brings forth fruit of itself. The husbandman that labors has a long patience for the precious fruit of the earth. God wants, God, God wants your response to come out of your heart itself because then it's meaningful, it's worship, right? It's not forced, it's not manipulated, it's not coerced. You know, I point a gun to the woman's head and I said, you tell me that you're madly in love with me or I'll kill you. And of course she's going to say, uh, 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 I'm madly in love with you. But is she really? <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Now, sometimes, yeah, we have to force the issue and name names and confront things when things get dangerous and things get out of hand. But first and foremost, the, the initial goal of God is to bring forth that fruit out of, out of the earth itself. For the earth brings forth first the, uh, no, first the blade. Yeah, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. And that's the way fruit is. It's a developing, it's a developing it's like first you get bring forth the blade or the foliage or the leaves, leaves, and it's not actual. The, the it's not the actual perfect fruit yet, but it's 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 that's okay because it's developing, and from that becomes the blade, and then within the blade can grow the fruit or the full ear of the corn. And so God has long patience for it. He's very patient for it, and so it's a real wisdom of judgment. It's a real wisdom of judgment that that you, whether. Whether you expose an issue and force an issue or not. Like I say, sometimes you do. Sometimes you have to force an issue because of our stubbornness, our blindness, the peril, the danger that we put ourselves in, or what have you. But ideally, the real goal is, let the earth bring forth 
fruit of itself. So we have the condition of worship here. Uh, uh, an act or a deed towards God that's meaningful toward Him. It's like I always said, if I'm a father and I have a son, I can tell my son every day, Son, it's Monday again, Monday morning. Would you please take out the garbage? Okay, Dad, I'll take out the garbage. But after a while, uh, I'm hoping that he'll just, he'll all by himself, he'll say, Oh, gee, Dad, it pleases Dad to take the garbage out on Monday. And look, oh, look, it's Monday. I, I guess I'll just go ahead and do it. Right? Isn't that more meaningful? Isn't that show a little more respect and honor and uh, acknowledgement of his father? Yeah, yeah so that's, that's the perfection we're talking about. Uh, as, as we've heard often, uh, repentance is the purest form of worship. We heard that statement a lot, and I've always taken that further and tried to expound it. Why is repentance the purest form of work, worship? Because by scriptural definition, repentance is against thee and against thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, as David said in Psalm 51, I guess it is. And uh, so what is repentance? Repentance is the turning of the heart, the sorrow of the heart. It's the godly sorrow of the heart. And it's the issue is between the individual soul and God. And it's no man is interfering with that. It is an issue exclusively, purely. It's a, when it's pure repentance, it's between you and God. When it's pure. And then nobody else can interfere. No one else can get the glory. Alright, so... But that just remember, repentance towards God can come from between you and God as a result of a man preaching the Word of God. But as far as exacting things out of each other as individuals, that's not really the goal. That's not really ideally the way God wants it to go. As I said before... Um, the finger of God. Jesus, uh, they said Jesus casts out devils by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. And he says, hey, if Satan casts out Satan, then his kingdom is divided and it can't stand. He said, now if I with the finger of God cast out devils, right? So what, how, well, what was the power of Jesus to cast out devils? It was the power of the Holy Ghost. So the finger of God is the Holy Ghost. So the finger of God is, is what, what you point with. Right? The Bible talks about putting forth of the finger. Right? Hey, you, you're wrong. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. I mean, there's a time to single out actions and deeds, as I said. It's not that it, that will never happen. But I'm talking about, ideally, this is what God is after. That the Holy Ghost is the one who identifies the individual's fault. And you get convicted. And then that, that therefore, your response of repentance is between you and the conviction that the Holy Ghost put upon you. Now the preaching of the Word of God assists the conviction. The preaching of the Word of God describes the holiness of God, the purity of God, what's required of us as Christians, gives you a standard to compare your actions and deeds to, and so that you can come to the conclusion that you fall short, you need to repent, and the Holy Ghost can convict you. As we said before, the Spirit of God without the Word of God has no tool to work with. You, you have to provide doctrine, preaching in the church. The, the doctrine, the understanding, the counsel is what the Holy Ghost uses to convince you. Right? It's like the law. The law was given so that you have something to compare yourself to to realize you don't measure up. If you didn't have nothing to compare it to, how would you know? So though through the law is knowledge of Sin Through the doctrine of Christ is the knowledge of God and it gives you the potential to come under conviction. But the Holy Ghost is the finger of God. The Holy Ghost is the one that says, Hey, Jonathan, you, you acted this way yesterday. You know that's not right. Or you know that this is not what charity would dictate or suggest or, you know, say, say what is required and what have you. So... The Holy Ghost becomes the finger of God, the identifier of the particular individual. Now we're getting into something where God is dealing with each one of us as individuals. He says, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you. Let's get back to something before I get into that too. Uh, I think it's pretty fundamental in principle. It's not hard to figure this out, that the way, the reason this is, is because 
This glory has to go to God. Man can't have any credit. Man can't have any kind of sense within himself that he has worthiness or he can do anything of his own power. If he does, he'll somewhere be emboldened to operate outside, uh, separated from the dictate of God or from the fellowship of God. Right? If I think I have power to do something of myself, then there's something in me that is a potential that I may come to the point where, well, I, I have power to do this of myself, therefore I don't need something over there. I can do it myself. And then you will, you will actually use your iniquity and your will to, to separate. We must be forever dependent on God so that we are forever cleaving to God, forever joined to Him, never to be separated from Him. As we said, like Lucifer was emboldened to exercise his will in independence. I will be like the Most High God. That's an act, an exercise of will in the absence of, God, of acknowledging God. All you need is one act, one deliberate act of will like that, and you begin the separation from God. That is an act of separation. Every act of self-will, every act of independence is a, it is traveling, it is another movement away from God, however small you think that movement away from God is. But if you want to deviate from the will of God even just a little bit, you know, when you do that, at the beginning, it may not seem like much, but remember, we're going to multiply that throughout all eternity. Right? So, it's like if we have two parallel lines, as I said before, one, one of those lines is the will of God, and the other line is your will. You want those lines to run with each other, together, throughout all eternity. And you say, well, uh, I'll just deviate just a little, just a point zero 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 one gazillionth of an inch to the right. And it doesn't seem like much, but multiply it throughout eternity. And the more you, more you go through eternity, the more separated you are. And you will be forever separating, getting further away and further away and further away from God. And here's another thing. There is nothing in creation that is static or stays still or stays the same. It never stays the same. Of the increase of His kingdom and government and God's glory, there shall be no end. It will be ever increasing. More glory and more glory and more glory. And the same to the people who are, are in hell. It will be more torment and more torment. Everything is progressing. Everything is progressive. Everything is getting more and more and more and more. As you can see, even as the example of what's happening now on the face of the earth, how did all this sin and iniquity have access to start polluting the world and the whole structure of the world and the whole structure of uh, the material world? Because Adam and Eve, Eve was in the transgression, they partook of the fruit, they disobeyed the command of God, and they obeyed the serpent, and then they surrendered their dominion to the serpent, who was Satan, and now Satan is the god of this world, and as the result of that one little deviation from what God said, just a, just one little bite from the fruit, one little thing, just a little thing, it has now multiplied and progressed and progressed to, to fall out to everything evil that's ever happened in the face of the earth, came out of that one little, seemingly insignificant, minor, minor deviation so-called, from what God said in the garden. So don't underestimate that. That's why we've heard, and when we were at the farm, Brother Sturr would say, not one iota of iniquity can enter into the kingdom of God. We have to be with God, with God, with God eternally. So God is calling us, I have not chosen, uh, I, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. He said, I have called you by name. I've called you by name. Put his finger on you. He said, you, 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 you. You know, Carl, Rich, Jonathan, Chuck, whatever. I called you by name. Singled you out. Decided to save you. Started doing things to cause you to approach. So it's God that works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. So of course the will has to be there. So that we have the opportunity of worship, and yet that will has to have the knowledge that it can never operate, uh, assume that it has its own power or its own merit 
or its own dependency that it doesn't need anything else, you must because that will embolden you to activate your will in eternity away from God, and not necessarily even away from God, but independent of God, which I guess implies away from God. It's the beginning of you moving away from God. So, all of that's very important and fundamental to salvation and worship. So we're talking about God putting His finger, the Holy Ghost. And now, I'm going to do a little aside here as I driving driving through Walterboro, um, I saw a billboard. This is why I like to try to stick to the Scriptures, and I don't like to take things too far, too many steps removed from Scripture, and that's why we should always do this. This is why I don't like using other versions of the Bible. I don't like any of that stuff uh, because it, it inevitably is going to take you away and it's going to... Uh, it's Well, I'll give you an example, okay? First of all, before I give you the example, I'll remind everybody what we heard about Richard Wormbrand, the statement he made. He said, Jesus is the truth and the doctrine of Jesus Christ is is teachings about Jesus. So it's in its truth, so it's the truth about the truth. And then theology is kind of expanding on the doctrine and filling in the blanks and giving a lot of description of God's purpose and, and so on that isn't I- I- implicitly in the scriptures but can be sort of implied by applying the principles and therefore we apply the principles that are in and the doctrine that's in the Bible and therefore we we assume that the, or we come to the understanding that must be like this. I'm, I'm being somewhat theological today. I'm, I'm telling you about the exercise and the importance and the role of what the will is in the worship of God. And, and a lot of what I'm saying doesn't have particular scriptures, but it's kind of based on scriptural principles and scriptural doctrine. I'm kind of filling in the blanks. That's like theology. So Jesus is the truth. The doctrine is the truth about the truth. Theology is the truth about the truth about the truth. Now we're already three times, two times removed from just Jesus. You don't, you go on and watch that. If you keep going on a trail like that, you, 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 all of a sudden you separate the truth from God. You separate it from Jesus and the scriptures. And I'll give you an example. It's not that there isn't true doctrine. There's true doctrine. It, it's not that there isn't true theology. There is true theology. That's revelation and theology. But every time you take a step away, there is a potential there. But let me tell you what I mean. For instance, I, I'm driving the, in, in Walterboro and there's a billboard with a picture of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. And it says, a house divided against itself shall not stand. Dash. Abraham Lincoln. Well, Abraham Lincoln didn't say that. Jesus Christ said that. <laughs> Jesus Christ said that, oh, you cast out devils by the prince of devils. He said, well, a kingdom, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, I'm not taking anything away from what might be the integrity of Abraham Lincoln, but what men have done is they have taken a saying of Jesus and they've ascribed it to Abraham Lincoln. If you ask Abraham Lincoln, I would hope and probably believe he had no problem confessing and acknowledging that he is quoting Jesus Christ. But that's not what I said on the billboard. So somehow we got too far removed and Jesus all of a sudden is now out of the picture. That's my point. You get too far removed from from the foundation and the source of the truth. First, Jesus himself or Christ in you or the Holy Ghost who's leading and guiding you into all truth using the Holy Scriptures which are expounded to you by preachers as doctrine and then later on, added to with a little bit of theology to insert and give you a bigger view of the grand eternal purpose of God and to reveal it to you, to fill in the blanks. But you get too far removed, and all of a sudden, where is Jesus? Where is he? So they're saying, Abe, Abe Lincoln said that. See, that's what, you know, patriots are like that. American patriots are like that. They take Bible principles, but you can see inevitably what happens is the Bible principles and the sayings of Jesus get removed from Jesus himself. Where is Jesus? And in this council, in this discourse of understanding and doctrine, I'm going to do my best to get to Colossians, and I want to 
address the issue of letting no man rob you of your reward in a voluntary humility or in a worshiping of angels. An angel is a messenger, a messenger with the word of God. We all know the Bible talks about how uh, men of God have honor and uh, prophets are not without honor and we're in a generation that despises dominion and we shouldn't despise dominion and uh, all of that. But there is a degree that you can, you can uh, lose your reward in a worshiping of angels where a man gets more preeminence and honor and, uh, let's say, respect or intention or ha- captures more of a part of your conscience and um, devotion and adoration than Jesus himself. I've been pressing this issue over and over and over again. If we're standing in front of preachers and he's preaching well, and you might say, what a preacher. I don't think that in and of itself there would be anything wrong with that if the motivation would be to honor that the preacher was a man sent from God. But if you have a hundred what a preachers and no what a savior, nobody ever says what a savior, all they say is what a preacher. You see, you understand there's a balance in this. It's like I said, there's all kinds of things that could be legitimate or acceptable uh, if it was done in its proper degree or proper measure. But as soon as you do it in excess, in superfluity, the excessiveness, the excessiveness takes it beyond its degree and pollutes something that would otherwise have been acceptable if it was done in its proper measure. You know, the people feared the Lord and Samuel. Yeah, you fear the Lord, but you fear the Lord first, then Samuel. And in times of conflict, where, where the, uh, the prophet it conflicts with the word of God itself, you go with the word of God. Balaam was a prophet. He was perverse. The dumb ass, he saw the angel. He saw the angel with the drawn sword ready to kill the prophet. Where was his allegiance? It was to the angel. It was to the angel. So, what I'm saying is... Uh, let no man rob you of your reward. Let's stop there and, and take it to uh, Isaiah 51. Well, and as I said last week or the week before, or maybe both, uh, God called Abraham. And as we see in Isaiah 51, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence you are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence you are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, with a small f, You know, call no man your father. I may talk about that, clear that up if I get a chance, or maybe not. But anyway, look unto Abraham your father, unto Sarah that bear you, for I called him alone. And that's a pattern and example for all of us. Look at Abraham. He's the first example and pattern of promise and faith and calling from God. And God put his finger and identified him individually. And God called him alone. Hey, Abraham, I'm calling you. I remember God calling me alone. And this is a characteristic of God's elect. Somewhere you you get a perception of how God has zeroed in on you. The great almighty God has got down close, personal, and called you by name. God called Abraham and God is saying, look, Look, you're, you're seeking after righteousness. You're, you're, you're trying to follow the Lord and get saved. Look, 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 you that seek the Lord. Look to this rock from whence you are hewn. This example of how God calls. Look unto Abraham. There's your pattern. God called him alone. And when God called him and swore to him and made promise to him, he swore by an oath, the book of Hebrews said. God couldn't swear by any greater. He swore by himself and he said, Abraham, blessing I will bless you. Multiplying I will multiply you. He made his decision. He made his call. He looked at Abraham. He foreknew that Abraham eventually could respond to do everything God called him to do. And on the basis of God's supernatural, all-knowing ability to know that Abraham would follow through, right at the beginning he said, I'll bless you, I'll multiply you. And he swore by an oath to Abraham. Swore by an oath. And if you are a child of God, as I said before, or whether you're not a child of God, God's going to swear to everybody. Everybody in the face of the earth, God's going to swear. Eventually, he'll swear 
by himself because he can swear by no greater that he will bless you, he'll multiply you, he will save you, he will swear that. He will swear it. And an oath cannot be taken back. An oath is absolutely final. It is the end of the issue. And the oath of offer, uh, an oath of confirmation, it's the end of all strife. It's the end of all question. It's the end of all wondering. God swore by an oath. It's sealed. It's finished. It merely has to come to pass. And he'll do the same thing for the wicked. He'll deal with you for a while. He'll endure with much long suffering until he's had enough. And then he'll swear in his wrath, you will never enter my rest. Never. Okay, if God swears to you like that, then forget it. You can get a thousand of the greatest preachers that ever lived to pray and fast for you for 40 days and 40 nights, and you will never be saved because God swore. It's that point of no return. When God swears, it's the point of no return. For righteousness, for unrighteousness. So now, the thing here is, look unto Abraham how God called him alone. Look unto Abraham your father. And this is what Jesus said. I've called you by name. So we're talking about the getting down, right down, intimate and personal between you and Jesus. And we can do this without denying the rest of the doctrine that there is hierarchy, there is authority in the flesh, and there's men of God and all that stuff. But don't let anything rob you of your reward. What did God say to Abraham when he called him alone? What did he say? What's the other thing he said? Right. Abraham, I am thy exceeding great reward. And I, I put it together with the scripture of, with the Levites. Levites have no part or inheritance in this life with the children of Israel. What is their inheritance? Who's the Levites' inheritance? Their inheritance is the Lord. I'm, I'm here to lose everything so I can win Christ. That is my exceeding great reward. Per, to get to the point... Well, I, I, I get it. In the deepest part of my being, I get it. God is interested in me. He's talking to me. You know, he's reproving me. He's correcting me. He's comforting me. He's blessing me. He's visiting me. Not to make it sound iniquitous, but it, it, it has to get to that, that, that personal. That's, that's the biggest part of having root in yourself when you know all that stuff. You have root in yourself. And the Bible saying, don't let anybody rob you of that personal pursuit in exchange for worshiping of angels. Where it's not that the angel or the messenger isn't worthy of some sort of honor, but in comparison, right? In comparison. What happens if the angel is perverse? If Balaam is perverse. You can't honor him above God, right? You can't do that. And the, and the dumbass didn't do it. Okay. Uh, and so don't let anyone rob you of your reward in the voluntary worshiping, uh, 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 humility, humility uh, voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. The other scripture there is in, in the Psalms. It talks about how the children of Israel in their idolatry, what did they do? They, they, they worshiped an ox. They worshiped the similitude of an ox that eats grass instead of God. Well, put it together with what Paul said in Corinthians. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. And he says, do you really think God's saying that because he cares so much about oxen? They're just animals. Or does, is God saying it for our sake? Like, is this like a, you know, a type, a figure of something else? He says, no doubt for our sakes he's saying it. The ox is the preacher. The corn is the seed, the word of God. So right now, I'm an ox. I'm treading out the corn. I'm treading it out. Right? We're plowing and we're inserting the seed and we're packing it in and putting some water on it and hoping it grows. God's sending forth His word is like the seed and it shall prosper in the thing where He sends it to. So we preach, we, su we, 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 we sow, we plow, we water, and we do it in hope. We do it by faith. And God decides what's going to prosper, where it's going to prosper, how much it's going to prosper. One sows, another waters. Who gives the increase? God gives the increase. 
Paul said, I transferred, once, once Paul said, I transferred these things in a figure to myself and Apollos that you ought not to think of us more highly than you ought. Well, go ahead and honor, but not more highly. Not at the expense of forgetting God. No, not, not 50 accolades for the man and, and one or two for Jesus. You see what I'm saying? Don't let any man rob you of your reward. Don't forget there's, a, there's the, the, the exercise and practice of submission to one another in the flesh. You're not going to do away with that. But I'm talking about the balance, the degree of things. So anyway, that's where I'm at. And this is something that's very characteristic of our first love. I can tell you me, when I, when I was saved and I finally got filled with the Holy Ghost, it was like the 4th of July or something like that, you know. And I walked around and it seemed like the anointing, not seemed like, it was the anointing of the Holy Ghost. It's like on me 24 hours a day, full of the love of God, crying all the time. I wanted everybody to know about Jesus. I was totally consumed, nothing but Jesus. I didn't care what was going on in my life around the world. But I was just one track mind. Jesus. All it was is Jesus. Jesus. He's my reward. Jesus. Jesus. He has the preeminence. There's no, no other devotion to other men or anything. It's all Jesus. All Jesus. Isn't that a characteristic of your first love? You left your first love. You forgot that He is the top of it all. He is the reason. He is the reward. He is what you want to cultivate, the relationship. He's the one that wants to get close and personal and single you out and put His finger on you. For, for everything. I mean, for reproof, for conviction, for, for comfort, for consolation. So what did they do? They, they, they changed the glory of God and changed it into a, some, the, the image of the similitude of an ox that eats grass. That's like, that's like the Christian... It's like modern Christianity as we know it. Organized Christianity... Honoring, honoring a church and calling it the Lutheran Church. Or well, what church are you in? I'm in the Lutheran Church. There is no Lutheran Church. There's only one church. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body, one hope are you calling. One, one, one. We're the church of Jesus Christ. Not of the Latter-day Saints. Not of the apostolic faith. We are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as soon as you start bringing in other names... You introduce the element of idolatry and you give people the opportunity to focus and idolize, idolize the man. Idolize the ox that treads out the corn. God doesn't want the oxen idolized. That's why you never put your own name on a ministry. It becomes a target for people to say, oh, it's so-and-so's ministry. I, we can call out all the names. It's not really necessary. You know, all, of, all the uh, ministries out there that have their names on them. But it, it all sets things up for idolatry. Inevitably, you end up losing your reward if you're not careful. Your reward is Jesus. Look unto Abraham your father and to Sarah that bear you. I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He shall comfort all her waste places and he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found there, and thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, mine arm shall judge the peoples, the isles shall wait upon me, and on mine arm shall they trust. Lift your eyes to the heavens, look to the earth beneath, the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, the earth shall wax old like a garment. So, in other words, the exhortation is, who, who, you know, don't emphasize, overemphasize the importance of the things of, of life. It's all passing away, right? And our, our, our life is like a vapor. Okay. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Hearken unto me, you that know my righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law, Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. That's an important, uh, an important um, encouraging admonition, if you want to call it, in the day when you can see. Um, and you heard me read the, read the headline that the Chinese have, uh, were destroying religious books and locking people up now. And you can see that uh, 
Christianity has become a laughing stock to the world and we're, we're about to be tagged by the New World Order as domestic terrorists. So they're going to come take all, all our Bibles and all that kind of stuff. They're going to start reviling. If you go to YouTube, there's all kinds of stuff on YouTube and social media of people absolutely making a complete troll and mockery of people like the, all the prosperity preachers. And they're fomenting a, a, a disgust and a mockery and a hatred towards everything that says they're Christian. And that's, that reproach is headed our way. It's going to fall on us. God says, don't, don't be afraid of the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. The moth shall eat them up like a garment, the worm shall eat them like wool, but my righteousness shall be forever and my salvation from generation to generation. Awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days and the generations of old. Art, art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Art thou not it which hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea away for the ransom to pass, pass over? Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return. I think of Jeremiah, the, the promise to us is, if we'll embrace this, if we'll hear this word and say, yeah, that's the truth, how do I return, Lord? Then, you know, God says about His people, I will heal their backslidings. They'll turn to me and I'll pour out the spirit of grace and supplications. I'll pour a spirit upon them while they'll start making supplications to me to return. I will cause them to approach. I will heal their backslidings. I will love them freely. This is, this is what awaits us as, as a return to our first love. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return. Come with singing unto Zion. Everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy. Sorrow and mourning shall flee away. And this, is, this next part of this chapter is something that's very, very close and personal to me. When I came out of the overcomer ministry and didn't know if I'd ever teach again, and I didn't, I was afraid of many things. I was bearing the threat of people over me in the Lord from Brother Stair himself, his threatening declarations of my demise, destruction, my challenging my very status with God. And uh, it plays on you. You wonder, is that really true? You wonder. It plays on you. And during. Uh, a number of visitations that I received from the Holy Ghost as God put His finger on me. As I, and this is very, very important to me because this is where I, the, my root and self got strengthened and cultivated. Okay? So listen, listen to this then. I, even I, am He that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die? And who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a son of man? which shall be made as grass, and forgettest the Lord, thy Maker. Now it doesn't say that you despise the Son of Man. It doesn't say that you don't, you stop regarding the fact that the Son of Man has been placed in a position of authority, and for the sake of the position itself, you should, you know, not despise that, as David didn't despise Saul as... They disputed with the devils, would not bring against the devils a railing accusation, all that kind of stuff. There is the underlying uh, regard and respect for authority in general, whether they're righteous or unrighteous, whether they're backslidden, apostatized or not. You understand? But he, he, there's a degree of comparison. You're afraid of a man that's going to die. You're afraid of the son of man threatening you. And he's just going to be like the grass. Here today, gone tomorrow, but you forgot the Lord, your maker. And there was a time, yeah, I was so distracted. My eyes had fallen to the uh, ox, the similitude of the ox. It obscured my view from the Lord, my maker. Now, I'm not saying I can exist as some independent guy and I don't need the body of Christ and I don't need to be under... No, I need all that stuff. But if it makes me forget the Lord, my maker, and if it's out of, out of degree so much that... All of my focus and regard and intention is on the angel and not enough of it's on the Lord. Well, that's not good. God did, doesn't want that. Y'all have a personal relationship with God. You've got to get it cultivated. Right? So, 
And you forget the Lord thy maker that has stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundation of the earth. And you feared every, continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor as if he was ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? Okay, so that's what I can, I can look at the scripture and look back and say, yeah, yeah, where is that fury? Here I am, restored back to my office, a regular exercise, fellowship with the saints. We have a little, you know, exercise and a function as a body of believers, however lame it is, at least it's something. We can, we can all enter into life like this, you know that, right? We may not have every part, but we can still enter in. Okay, so where's the fury? The captive exile hastens that he may be loosed, and that he should not die in the pit, nor that his bread should fail. See? I have bread, I have teaching counsel, it's the bread of life. Is it going to fail God? Is that it? I'm no longer involved in any ministry, and I'm living out of a hotel room... Uh, fixing toilets for hotels, is that my end? Is my bread going to fail? Is anyone ever going to hear me teach again? And that was my concern. That was my fear. But he says, But I am the Lord thy God that divided the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. And of course, you all know this is not exclusive to me, but I can talk about it in reference to me because I of my own personal experience. And then, But this is, this is how God wants... This is how God wants to deal out His goodness and grace to every one of us as individuals. Every one of us has these experiences. And we can draw upon it. We can remember that when the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will shed abroad His love, a witness of His love in our hearts, and He'll bring to our remembrance all these past experiences where He covered you in the shadow of His hand. He held you in, by your right hand and said, Fear not, and all of that. So awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunk in the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. There is none to guide her among all the sons whom she hath brought forth, neither is there any that taketh her by the hand of all the sons that she hath brought up. These two things are come unto thee, who shall be sorry for thee, desolation, destruction, famine, sword. By whom shall I comfort thee? Thy sons have fainted, they lie at the head of all the streets as a wild bull in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord and the rebuke of thy God. Therefore, hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. So you're drunken. You may, we may get drunken in our affliction, distracted by the battles that are going on in our mind, the challenges to our faith, the challenges to our status with God, and what have you. Well, those are the times you need to dig deep and dig in and pray and seek God until you can make a connection between you and the Holy Ghost in your heart and you can have these things become more than just scriptures, but things that God has fulfilled in you dramatically, personally, with His presence. And then they become a living experience that you can draw upon, a confidence, that increase your confidence with God. Thus saith the Lord, Thus saith thy Lord the Lord, and thy God that pleadeth the cause of His people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again. But I'll put it into the hand that afflict thee, which have said to thy soul, Bow down, that we may go over. And thou hast laid thy body as the ground, and as the streets to them that went over. Talking about people who yielded and submitted themselves to things supposedly that were in the name of Jesus or in the name of the righteousness of God which weren't, which were actually evil things, but you laid your bodies to the ground and, you, and people served themselves off of you, took advantage of, it, uh, took advantage of you, used your gifts, your callings, your abilities to further their own lusts, their own agendas. Right? Now the Bible says they misused the prophets. Well, that's in the Old Testament. Don't think for a minute that you can't misuse the teacher. Or that you can't misuse a saint. Or you can't misuse a sister. Don't think it's just for prophets. Yeah. yeah. Dare any man defraud his brother in any matter. For the Lord is the avenger of such. And the God will plead the cause of his people. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And I'll, I'll testify that I've watched my calling be misused. My abilities as a teacher be exploited by men over me and the Lord for their own personal lust. And then have the same people say, oh, 
don't misuse the prophets, and I'll say don't misuse the teacher then. It can, it can, it can go in all these directions. This is what I'm saying. There, there, there is a perspective. I'm not trying to cancel out your regard for authority in the flesh. You understand that? God has authorities in the flesh. God has ministers. He has authorities. Submission and authority is just a part of it until we are per perfected. And, and seeing that submission is the most important principle, submit yourself unto God. God always tries us first by submitting to fleshly authorities that we can see, right? Before we can submit to God whom we don't see. It's kind of a stepping stone, right? You know, uh, how can any man say, I love God who he, hath, who he hath not seen if he doesn't love his brother who he does see? You've got to prove that you love your brother that you do see. Then you can... You can perfect it to love God who you don't see. And submission is the same way because submission works by love. Right. If you love me, submit. Keep my commandments. All right. So that point's made. Um, so, okay. But God says after a while, when people use you and abuse your anointings and callings enough, and he delivers you. He says, well, now I'm going to put the affliction. You are afflicted by all of that. Now I'm going to put the affliction in the hands of those who afflicted you. The ones who said, bow down, submit, so I can do my own thing, my lust, my whatever. And you, you laid your body as the ground and all of that. All right, now moving on, Isaiah 55. Ho, everyone that thirsts, come to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisf satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and ye eat, the, eat ye that which is good. Let your soul delight in its fatness. Incline your ear, come unto me, here and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. This goes back into God's swearing by His holiness, entering into the covenant, making a promise, you know, swearing by Himself that He'll love you, He'll save you. Behold, I have given Him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee, because of the Lord thy God, and for the Holy One of Israel, for He hath glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while He may be found, call ye upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way and the unrighteous man his thoughts oh so you know repentance has is not just it's not just casting out the thoughts of unbelief but it's also forsaking your wicked way now, i'll emphasize that as long as i can you know i'll make the point because that's i'm i'm going to try to bring this into the uh the doctrine of the nicolaitans and i'm going to hopefully reach something here that really shows especially what we came out of in the overcomer ministry, how first the doctrine of the Nicolaitans becomes deeds and practices, and then afterwards, as Brother Kirk said in one of his messages, first it became, you have the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, then later on, and as the church ages progressed, you have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. First it becomes deeds, then it becomes a doctrine. Now this is directly related to People who do not want to stop their sin and therefore they have to pervert the word of God and turn it into a doctrine to allow the progression and continuation of evil and sin. This is directly related to the Nicolaitans. I hope I have a chance to get to it. All right. Well, anyway, let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. He will have mercy upon him and to our God and he will abundantly... Pardon. I know the thoughts I think of you, God said. Thoughts of peace, not of evil. To give you an expected hope in your latter end. We're coming to the latter end. We just described our own condition of backsliding and in and, and some cases even worse, apostasy. And return from your backsliding. God said he, if you do, He will heal you of your backslidings. What are we returning to? And we're returning to our... First love. And what was the characteristic of our first love? Everything was Jesus. He was our great reward. But somehow, Christianity has degenerated into a worshipping of angels. It's like, just like the two great commandments. Hear, O Israel, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. The second's like it, namely like it, not love thy neighbor as thyself. 
But what does the secular world, world, world do? They See, this is what I was saying before about removing things from identifying it with the scriptures and identifying with Jesus. Identify with Jesus. Identify with Jesus. Yeah, you can honor a man of God, but always take it back to Jesus. Don't hold the head. Hold the head. Hold the head. Hold the head. Don't forget the Lord your God, your maker. Bring it back to Jesus every time, deliberately. Don't lose that reward. Yeah. Yeah, there's another scripture saying that Israel says, saying to a stock, thou art my father, and, and to a, a stone, thou hast brought me forth. We're lively stones. No lively stone brought me forth. Jesus brought, you for, brought me forth. Jesus brought you forth. I, 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 I get that. Now I'm losing something I was going to say, but that's all right. Because there's lots to say, and I'm sure God will have it said what needs to be said. But, um, yeah, he will abundantly pardon. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. The heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts higher than your thoughts. As the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, bread to the eater, so shall my word be that go forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So there it is, the word of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracle, the mouthpiece of God. So that identifies that scripture with preaching and doctrine. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Moreover, with me, it is a very small thing that should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart and shall every man have praise of God. See, should be no Lutheran church, should be no Jimmy Swagger ministry, none of that. The worship being the similitude of an ox that eats grass. And what was the gold, what was the uh, sin of Exodus 32 while Moses was up in the mount? They made a golden calf. And gold represents honor and glory and things that draw attention. They made the calf a golden thing and worshipped the calf instead of the Lord. Don't let anybody rob you of your, of your reward. And I'm not speaking against men of God. I'm not speaking against honoring men of God. I think all of you here should know that. Uh, and I'm just saying that anticipation of the challenges that might come to this kind of council. Okay, but anyway, let's go on. Um... These things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sake, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Who maketh thee to differ from another? For what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory if thou hadst not received it? And I always point out in the uh, accounts of Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel, Ezekiel 34, woe to the shepherds, woe to the pastors, Destroy and scatter the sheep in my pasture. <clears throat> it talks about with force and cruelty you've ruled over them. And it gives all the indictment against the pastors. Scattering the flock. Living unto themselves. Seeking their own. Getting their own pleasure. Making havoc. And all that kind of stuff. He says now, you know, they had rams and then they had he goats. They had, you know, sort of, there's a hierarchy in animals, right? You have animals have hierarchy. They have a pecking order. Chickens have a pecking order. Even the animal kingdom testifies of rank and authority. But then finally God says, I think in Ezekiel, well, now I judge between cattle and cattle. I don't care if you're a ram. I don't care if you're a he-goat. I don't care if you're top cheese, the apostle Paul, or the lowest saint on the totem pole. I don't care who you are. I'm just going to judge you. You're all like a bunch of cattle to me. I'll judge between cattle and cattle. Yeah. If you got the guy who has five hundred quadrillion dollars, and he sees two kids fighting and uh, two kids comparing themselves, and the one kid says, uh, "Oh, I got ten pennies," and the kid laughs and says, <laughs> "So what? I got a thousand dollars. I'm better than you. You know, that's like a hundred thousand pennies." And then the super duper quadrillionaire is looking at them both, shaking his head. You're both just a bunch of punks to me. 
Mm. Right? Because I got the quadrillion dollars. I don't care if you got a thousand or you have a penny. Both of you are just nothing. And besides, I'm the guy that gave it to you. <laughs> right? Well, there is a time when God just looks down and we've been spending a lot of time talking about the state of the church. The whole head is from the top of the head to the sole of the feet. All, of, all are profane from prophet to priest. And everyone deals false. You can go on down the line. And I said, we used to say, uh, it's good to identify sin, but it's also good to identify with, with sin. It's good to identify the backsliding, the apostasy, but it's also very good if you identify with. I identify with the backsliding. I'll freely confess my backsliding. I've described it to you. And, but I also have a, a growing confidence, and it's really growing. I, I am returning. I have a determination growing in me. Why? Because I'm challenged by my own words. I'm challenged by my circumstances. I'm challenged by my own bitterness and miserableness when, it, when I get miserable. I'm challenged by it. I've missed something. I've left something. What is it? <laughs> back, back to the priorities. Back to the first love. Never mind this guy, that guy, the other guy. What will this man do, Lord? Well, what's that to you? Return from your backslidings. Oh, so on. So, okay. So, who do you make differ from another? What hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst not receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received us? We all know that in principle, right? I mean, the acknowledging of the mind and the spirit of our minds. Who, who are we any different than anybody else? What do we have that God didn't just give us? What, what makes one person better than the other? Nobody's better than the other. They have different uh, endowments of spiritual things. And if one guy's given more, more is required of them. More is required. It's like I, I always like the simple allegories of a car. Uh, I can have a 53-foot, uh, 18-wheeler diesel truck. And that thing, it can, that can carry a lot of weight. That can do a lot of work. That can pull a big load. And the old Toyota Prius, so I can't pull a darn thing, right? So is the Prius better than the truck? Is the truck better than the Prius? Well, the Prius can do some things the truck can't. Did you know that? Like if you go downtown and you want to parallel park in front of the grocery store and buy your groceries, you don't take your 18-wheeler down main drag to do that. So it's not like one's better than the other. Everyone's, yeah, one's stronger than the other, but that doesn't make it better. It doesn't make it more or less important has equal importance. Equal importance. Everybody has importance. Right? So that's, and that's, that's sometimes the, the perspective you've got to renew yourself in from time to time. God can just look down and look at the greatest and look at the least and say, yeah, it's all the same to me. Just a bunch of useless vessels if I hadn't have done something. And so, it's like, uh, when uh, Israel was a whoring, the whole the whole nation was a whoring from prophet on down. They're all a whoring, and uh, was it Ezekiel thirteen or fourteen? If any man uh, asks, uh, sets the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and comes to inquire of the prophet and asks the prophet to seek God for him according to his idols and his iniquity, God says, "I, the Lord, will answer that man by himself." And if the prophet's deceived, I've deceived the prophet to deceive that man because he's asking me according to his idols. He's not asking because he really is interested in a relationship with God. He's asking for, according to the abundance of his idols. He says, because the whole house of Israel has gone a-whoring, that I may take Israel in their whorish heart, or something like that. See, the context is, and he, then he goes on, he says, and the punishment of the prophet's going to be the same as the punishment of the idolater who, who sought the prophet. So don't think that the prophet, because he was deceived, he's off the hook, because since God deceived him, to get at that other guy who was the idolater. No, you're both idolaters. No, you're both deceived. No, you're both backslidden. No, you're both whatever. You understand? The punishment of the prophet's the same as the one who sent unto him. God was dealing with Israel as a whole. All right, now, and I've often told you the story of when I was in Canada with Brother Glenn, and uh, I began to function in my calling, and I thought, boy, I know a lot of stuff, and I'm a lot better than these guys. And I mean, I didn't think of that too deliberately in my conscience, but my heart was getting lifted up, obviously. And then uh, the Holy Ghost anointing fell in the kitchen, and we're, me and Glenn and some of the other saints were there. And then uh, 
for me, the whole, the whole room turned into a white luminous cloud, and all of a sudden, all the material surroundings disappeared, and all I saw was all this white luminous glory and Glenn's face, and that's all I saw. And Glenn began to prophesy in the first person, like it was the Lord himself speaking, and it was directed to me, and it was a, a, a big rebuke. You know, what do you have that you haven't received? You're not doing the teaching. I'm doing the teaching. Why do you glory like, like you have the ability? And the, I, I don't remember word for word, but, you know, I felt really awful after that. But it was just the first real striking experience of God dealing with me personally on, on this, this issue. I'm not even, I'm not even going to say that I have no more trouble with that. I'm sure I do. I slip into a knowledge puffeth up. And that's what we all got to understand. But that, that, that was a real illustration of this scripture for me. The first time it was that dramatic. Who makes you to differ from another? Why do you glory as, as if you haven't received something? Like you're the notch above everybody. What's wrong with you? No, you, you don't differ from anybody down the lowest of the saints. You, you're no different. God can turn around and say, I don't care who you are. You're all a bunch of cattle to me, and I'm going to deal with all of you. <laughs> you understand? This is, this is the kind of perspective I've been in for a while. But now we'll bring it back into the first love and the stuff about the Nicolaitans. All right, so I'll start with the uh, scripture in Revelation. I believe it was the, uh, yeah, the Ephesus. Revelation 2 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them. Liars. So there's some good things here. There's some good perceptions. And some good cultivating of the divine nature. You know, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. All that, right? So elements of that here. And you have borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Well, I kind of relate to that. I've tried to stick with it. I've tried to labor for the Lord and I haven't fainted all, you know, I try not to faint from, from striving to know what God's will is. And, and you can put yourself in there wherever you perceive that. And nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen or backslidden and repent and do the First works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And we're going to see that that's where we are right now. We hate the deeds. We hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. I think, where the, I think Brother Kirk said they were a conquering priesthood. And there's more to it than that. I'm going to read an account of Nicolaitans that I pulled off some reference material on the internet. Okay. Nicolaitans, a term appearing in Revelation 2, verses 6 and 15, describing members of the Christian congregations who held a doctrine that the Lord hated. Irenaeus said that they were followers of Nicholas of Antioch, a proselyte who was among the seven men chosen to serve the Jerusalem congregation. That's just historically what they said. I, I haven't vetted this out. And that's not really what I'm after. You'll see the point I'm making. Who, has, who had forsaken true Christian doctrine, he said they lived in an unrestrained indulgence. Unrestrained indulgence. Turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, which is unrestrained or unbridled lust. Excessive lust. Not occasionally falling once in a while and scrambling and trying to fight the fight and fight against sin again. It's unrestrained lust. Over and over Provisional, deliberate, as I keep saying. This is related to the doctrine of the and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So it's very applicable to overcome our ministry and all the things that we've seen and we're talking about. Hippolytus confirmed this by noting that Nicholas left correct doctrine and had the habit of indifference to what a man ate or how he lived or the conduct in his body. Indifference doesn't matter. 
It's not that important. God doesn't care. It's all covered. Do you get the idea? This is, this is related to the Nicolaitans. The, the apostolic constitutions describe them as shameless in their uncleanness. Shameless. Seared conscience. No remorse. No incentive or impetus to return from the excessive, superfluous, uh, lustful, wicked practices that were serving themselves. Although Clement of Alexandria defended Nicholas by insisting that his followers had misunderstood him, he observed that the Nicolaitans abandoned themselves to pleasures like goats in a life of shameless self-indulgence. Now the church has uh, of Ephesus, God says, you have this, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. I hate, I hate that, that people take grace and it allows them to go into the excess of pleasure and lust. I hate that. And yet, as much as I hate it, God is saying, but you have a problem too, son. You've left your first love. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So, it's good though. It's good that you hate the uh, deeds and doctrine of Nicolaitans. Like, okay, I'll say that in a minute here. In, in a letter to the church at Pergamum, the Nicolaitans were associated closely with those people who held the teachings of Balaam. Balaam, who committed... Teach my, seduce my people to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. This may have been a play on words. Nicolaitans could have been derived from two Greek words, Nikon, which means to conquer, and Laos, which meant people, to conquer the people, to hold ironclad control over people, to use uh, gifts and callings and the demonstration and the principles of authority and submission upon the people to exact out of them and hold lordship over them beyond the degree that God wants you. Neither being lords over God's heritage, but be examples to the flock. Jesus said, I did. You, you guys, you Gentiles, you exercise lordship. You, your, your Gentile dominion and authority is like to put the, the yoke on everybody and to, to exercise total dominion and control so everything goes the way you want it. He said, not, not, not going to be so among you. He that's, you know, le uh, greatest among you shall be, yeah, the highest authority shall act like a servant. He'll take the form of a servant. It's not exacting. Authority in, in the church is not exacting. It's not lordship. Now put that together, what I said at the beginning of the message, because God's goal is that the fruit brings forth of itself. There's too much exacting, too much dictating from the fleshly authority about what individuals do and say and eat and who they marry and where they go. Too much exacting like that. You, you stripped away the platform for worship. You stripped away the conditions where the earth can come forth of itself. You've left oversight and you've taken up lordship to conquer and control the people so that you can use them for your pleasure. That's, that's Nicolaitans. It involves conquering, using your authority to conquer and control. And then it also involves changing the counsel and doctrine of God to allow for that. Right? As it says here in this account, Nicolaitan forsook, forsook true Christian doctrine. Oh, God doesn't care what you do. Holy, uh, purity in the flesh is not an issue. It's whether you believe. You know, that's false. But it's changing the true Christian doctrine to allow unrestrained indulgence. I listened to Brother, Brother Stare again on the radio today. He said, let's change the truth of God into foolishness. No, not foolishness. I mean, Stan has picked up on this too. It's lasciviousness. Lasciviousness isn't just foolishness. Lasciviousness is deliberately, specifically, unbridled, unrestrained lust. That's what's happened over there. That's what, that, what, that's what it's become. First, it's the deeds. First, you practice all the unrestrained lust. Then when conviction tries to hit you, God tries to deal with you. He scourges you, chastises you. And you have to come to grips that you're not right. And God's uh, not allowing this. But you love your lust. Then what do you got to do? You got to change the doctrine. Yeah. Then the deeds of the Nicolaitan becomes the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And you gotta change, you gotta, 
corrupt the counsel of God to sear your conscience to continue in it. And so this whole issue of the Nicolaitans is directly relatable to what we witnessed. So he left the correct doctrine and developed a doctrine which is indifferent to what man eats or how he lives. That's very fitting. I, I wasn't looking for this either. I stumbled onto this. So it was like Balaam. Balaam could be derived from two words, Bela, which meant to conquer, and Ham, which meant people. So even the word Balaam and the word Nicolaitans, their derivation, where they came from, is very similar. So it's related to the doctrine of Balaam as well, which is the same issues. Fornication, things sacrificed to idols, teaching my people, teaching my people. People who would not have otherwise done this without this influence. Remember I was saying the other week, for from the prophets profaneness has gone forth into all the land. We're, we're account Ministers are accountable. We need to be faithful to the call of holiness and purity. If a man is a steward, moreover and steward, a man has to be faithful. Faithful. Faithful to the call. Faithful for, to the perfecting of the saints. You glorify God in your body. And in your spirit. Stories recorded of the seduction of the Israelites into immoral and idolatrous unions with the women of Moab. Had this situation had not been checked, Israel would have been destroyed as a nation. And attributed the success of this seduction of God's people to the evil influence of a prophet named Balaam. Who advised Balak, king of Moab, to follow such a course of action. Balaam became, therefore, in, Hebrews, in, in Hebrew history... A symbol of an evil man who led people into immorality and sin. They ran greedily after the error of... They, paint, and they perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Balaam got destroyed in the Old Testament. And I know the Bible... Balaam did prophesy, prophesy, let me die the death of the righteous. But, you know, you can prophesy something that's true and yet not live to be a partaker of it yourself if your conduct falls away. You know, I can preach to others and myself be cast away. Now, I'm not saying one way about Balaam. I haven't vetted and sought the whole thing out. At this point, I don't believe Balaam will save, but anyway, that, that's another issue. But for the purpose of what we're saying here, it's pretty clear. The Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of Nicolaitans, they run parallel. They're almost like one and the same. It's like Nicolaitans is the New Testament version of it, of what was already a pattern described by the works of Balaam back in the Old Testament. So, the letter to the church of Pergamum specifically charged them with having seduced people into eating meat offered to idols and into acts of fornication. The decree of the Jerusalem Council, Acts 15, had laid down also two specific conditions upon the Gentiles were to be admitted into the Christian fellowship. One, they were to abstain things offered to idols. And two, they were to abstain from fornication. <laughs> now, Acts 15 is something I picked on quite a while ago. Because both Brother Stair and other men of God like to point to Acts 15. Then Peter stood up. Then Peter stood up. Straightened it all out, right? The Son of Man straightened it all out. But at the end, at the end of Acts 15, a, a guy named James stands up. And as I pointed out, it's not, not the James who was the apostle because he was, he had already, that James had already been beheaded by Herod. This James has no designation. There's no reference to a place of authority or a calling or anything else. It's just James. And James stands up and says, listen, Here's my sentence. Here's my counsel. Here's my idea. Let me chime in on this. Uh, they have them that read Moses every Sabbath day. So for now, let's just tell them to uh, not to eat things that uh, strangled or blood, nor to eat things sacrificed to idols, and tell them not to commit fornication. Let's just do that for now. And then they have them every Sabbath that read Moses, and we can pick up on the rest later. I'm kind of filling in the blanks here. And... What, is, what, what did all the big, high up, sons of men, big, big uh, godly men of authority say? Hey, that's pretty good. We like that. We'll take that counsel. See? So Peter stood up, then James stood up. <laughs> Sometimes little old James can stand up and come up with the right counsel. You see what I'm saying? It's not exclusively always Peter. 
or exclusively always the Son of Man. Peter stood up, but read the rest of the chapter. James stands up at the end. He, James gave the godly counsel at the end. And what was that counsel? Abstain from fornication. So, yeah, the decree of the Jerusalem Council laid down the two conditions. And these were the very re regulations that the Nicolaitans violated. The very things. So can you see this conflict? We have a present day son of man violating fornication and idolatry. And we're the little James standing up saying, No, let's don't eat things to idols. Don't let any man rob you of your reward. Don't worship men. Yeah, honor men, but don't worship men. And get it in order. Get it in the proper measure and degree. Stop forsaking your personal relations. Don't, don't honor a man of God at the expense of Jesus. Simple enough? That's what's happening. Honor, you're honoring the man of God at the expense of Jesus. There is no Jimmy Baker, Swagger, Kenneth Copeland ministry. You're honoring a man at the expense of giving the glory to Jesus. That's wrong. Don't let anybody rob you of a reward. Okay, fine. Call out evil for what's evil. and uh, But still, don't lose your sense of respect for authority and dominion wherever you find it, right? Because God said, submit yourself to every ordinance of man. And all the men of God would, would always honor the authority of their day, whether they were saved or not. Daniel says, O king, live forever, right? You have to honor authority. And you have to submit to authority. But, again, we're talking about the balance. Okay. So, the very things James stood up at the end of Acts 15 are the things that the Nicolaitans um, transgressed and violated. It's like we always say, this is not legalism. It's holiness. It's not about legalism. It's not about do this and don't do that. It's about honoring God. They were a people. This is the Nicolaitans. They were a people who used Christian liberty as an occasion for the flesh against just as Paul warned against in Galatians 5.13. Brethren, you've been called unto liberty, only don't use liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. The enticement to such a course of action was the pagan society in which Christians lived, where eating meat offered to idols was common. Sexual relations outside the marriage were completely acceptable in such a society. Kind of sounds like our society today. The Nicolaitans attempted to establish a compromise with the pagan society of the Greco-Roman world that surrounded them. The people most susceptible to these teachings were no doubt the upper classes who stood to lose the most by a separation from the culture to which they had belonged to before their conversion. It may be that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was dualistic. They probably reasoned that the human body was evil anyway. So don't worry about what the body does. Oh, it's evil anyway. Oh, we heard Brother Stair say that all the time. Ah, it's just the old flesh. Let it do what it's want. It's evil. It's, it's, it's going to sin anyway. It's going to sin anyway. You know, the leper can't change its spots. So just, just let it do its thing and just ignore it. Well, what's the problem with that? The problem is that the Bible says... Reckon yourselves dead to sin, alive to God. You do not have to obey sin. Do not let it rule in your mortal bodies. Neither yield your members, the instruments, the pieces of your body. Don't yield them as instruments to perform unrighteous actions and deeds. You reckon that you're dead to sin. If I say, oh, well, it's going to sin anyway. Don't just paint. No, never mind. It doesn't really matter. What am I doing? I'm reckoning myself alive to sin. I'm disobeying the gospel. I'm disobeying the gospel. I'm perverting the word of God. I just turned that scripture of Ro in Romans, reckon yourselves dead to sin, and I just turned it into a lie. It's what I did. Didn't, didn't say a word. Just <laughs> didn't, didn't quote the scripture but I just turned it into a lie. This is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing God hates. He hates it. He hates it. It's His holiness at stake. You're profaning the holiness of God. 
with no conscience. He hates it. It's okay. We can hate it. A righteous hatred. Thou was love righteousness and I hate it. <laughs> I heard him say, oh, I didn't force, I didn't force anybody. It's the women and all of that. It's, it, and he's talking physical. And he always visits that issue once in a while. This issue is about spiritual coercion. It's, about, it's subtler than a physical force. It's worse than a physical force. It's a manipulation of God Himself and His Word Himself. It's a very subtle thing. It's like a trap that catches people that wouldn't otherwise submit to such evil deeds. It's worse. The bo- they, they reasoned, the Nicolaitans reasoned that the body's evil anyway, and only the spirit's good. Now, isn't that what it's like? A Christian, therefore, could do whatever he desired with his body because it had no importance. A fool makes a mock of sin or belittles the importance of the body to be the expression of an image of, of Christ in your flesh. Therefore, you cannot, you know, you, you're not supposed to commit sin in your body. All right. The Spirit, on the other hand, is the recipient of grace, which meant that grace and forgiveness were the Nicolaitans no matter what they did. It didn't matter what they did in the flesh. They automatically, forever, no matter what, qualify for grace. Now, when the Bible says, lest any man fail of the grace of God, what's the context? In Hebrews, it's, the context is Esau. He's one of, the, one of the issues of the context of that scripture. And what did he do? He sold his birthright for a little morsel, a little romp in the sack, a little pleasure for a few minutes with some, uh, somebody who you're not supposed to have relations with. He sold it for one little morsel. Fail of the grace of God? Well, what, what is the grace of God supposed to accomplish? For the grace of God that brings salvation to the pure and all men, teaching us that deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Live soberly, righteously. Live, 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 live. Not think, not believe, not have faith in. Live, live, live. Soberly, righteously, godly. Where? When Jesus comes the second time? No. In this present evil world. There's your mark. Don't take that mark down. Preach that mark. Hold it right up there. Hold it right up there. So what does grace do? It teaches you that. So what's grace for? Grace is like if we were in the Old Testament and committed adultery, we'd be stoned and that would be the end of it. But grace says, okay, we're going to hold back this penalty. We're going to give you grace. Now look, here's why you shouldn't do this. Now get up and you strive against that thing again. You strive against it and I'll help you. <clears throat> and so you strive against it. I said what, what characterizes the error of our generation and even the overcomer ministry is they have turned grace into something that allows you to strive towards sin. You, whenever you strive towards sin, you, you're, 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 you're failing the grace. The grace of God is to cover you in your occasional fallings and stumblings as you're really trying to live righteously and as you're discovering you can't do it on your own. And it's a process and a lesson God's teaching you and grace is sufficient to cover you so that you can overcome and then live without that sin, eventually, by going through the operation of God. It's an operation with many different elements, and we've talked about it many times, and I'm not going to go expound it. But you know what I'm saying, most of you. So, here you go. So, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. This is so much like how things were perverted over there. It's, it, I found it uncanny, actually. A Christian can do whatever he desires with his body. It has no importance. The Spirit, on the other hand, is the recipient of the grace, which meant that grace and forgiveness were his no matter what he did. There were, there were those ready to compromise with the world. They were judged by the author of Revelation to be the most dangerous because the result of their teaching would have conformed the rest of Christianity to the whole world. Rather than to have Christianity change the world or have Christianity transform you into a holy, pure, righteous, 
living creature giving exemplify, exemplifying the divine nature and giving glory to God and having the righteousness of God and the divine nature on display in your mortal body. Instead, doctrines of the Nicolaitans would have all of Christianity conform to the world and think nothing of continual fornication and idolatry and God doesn't care what happens in the flesh. Oh, it's going to sin anyway. No. There's no scripture, no scriptural basis to embrace that kind of thinking at all. That's not the mind of Christ. It's not the mind of Christ. What is it? It's the mind of anti-Christ. Yeah. It's dangerous. This Nicolaitan stuff was dangerous. Perilous times shall come. If any man consent not to wholesome words, even the doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is according to godliness, it's proud knowing nothing. Eusebius, I don't know how to pronounce that. Eusebius. Eusebius indicated that this sect did not last very long, and in all probability, the only knowledge of their teaching that is possible will be found in these slight references in the book of Revelation. Well, it's enough of a reference, and it's enough of the description of how their deeds operated and how later it became a doctrine to uh, transfer that figure into our situation and our, our point in time right here and now. Now, uh, see what I'm saying is that you, you, you have to remember... Okay, let's read the scripture in Colossians. I actually did not read it yet. Okay, Colossians 2, starting verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he had not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the yeah. head. In everything we do, everything, every honor we bestow, every act, we, everything we do back and forth to each other, we should always be holding the head. Right? If, if, I, if you want to be long-suffering to me, there's something that bothers you about me and you're, you're long-suffering with me. Why are you long-suffering with me? Because you have to. You won't, you won't be long-suffering towards me in the love of God unless you hold the head. Oh, there's Jonathan now. Now, he's the son of God now. For Christ's sake, I've just got to be long-suffering with him as God works with him. And, and then in, in reverse, right? So why would you be long-suffering? Because you're holding the head. Oh, because he belongs to Christ. Forgive one another as God for... Christ's sake, you're holding the head for Christ's sake. No, there's that. Well, that guy did some great preaching. That's because it's Christ in him. Wow, Lord, you are a great preacher. You know, thanks for anointing that guy. Sending me your word. I'm, I'm holding the head. I don't care who the guy is. Well, in a, once in a while I do, I guess. But I'm in measure, right? In measure. But you always got to hold the head. Things get out of balance. Okay, there you go. Not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the word world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all, all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. Mortify, therefore... Put to death. Put to death. Do not allow these motions and movements and expressions in your body. Am I expounding it good enough? Put to death. Do not allow to occur in your body. Your members which are upon the earth. Put to death. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked 
sometime when you lived in them, but now ye also put off all these. So you see, there is a case to be made about the spiritual sins too. There is a case to be made there too. Put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing you put off the old man with his deeds. So when you put off the old man, what are you putting off? His deeds, his actions. Pretty clear. And I put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. And that's why we need knowledge, which is renewing our minds about the new man. The importance of holiness, seeking God. Hey, we have a responsibility to reflect the image of Christ in our mortal bodies. Right? What's it motivating? It's motivating you to think right, sanctify yourself, seek God, press towards the mark. It's all doing that. You put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond, free. Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfection. Right? We're going on to perfection. So what's the emphasis on? It's on charity. It's on love. So God says, you've left your first love. You first love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then once you are restored and you are made whole, that love of God can be communicated and give increase out into the church. Now, if you are not perfected and you are a wounded soul, then you're preoccupied with your wounds, you're preoccupied with your afflictions, and you're seeking your own resolve, you're seeking your own comfort. Now, love does not seek its own, but people are in a wounded condition sometimes where they can't do anything but seek their own. They need to be healed, they need to be restored, they need to be made whole before they can have the capacity to let love express itself outwardly. You know, God so loved, He gave, gave, love gives. Why? Because love if I have root myself and I'm whole and I'm, I'm restored, I don't have any need. I don't have any fear. I don't have any hang-ups because I'm made whole. I'm one with the Father. I'm one with Jesus. And therefore, I am free to express love. But when you're tangled up in the bondages and the fears and the doubts and the wounds, then you're not at liberty. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it critically. I'm saying this is the state of people. When they're wounded, they don't have the capacity to love. That's why... Love, 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 the onus of love, the beginning of love, the first people that must love are always, 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 always the higher vessels. Always. The onus is on the higher vessels to love first, not for the higher vessels to try to require love from the lesser to cover them. It doesn't work like that. If it worked like that, none of us would be saved. We love him because he first loved us. That's why I'm, that's what I'm saying. If an overseer knows something of, uh, offends a sheep that's below him in the Lord, something offends them, the onus of charity is on him to stop doing the things that offend those who are under him. He has to instigate that. He has to show the charity first. He has to do it first. Charity, the flow of charity always starts from the top and comes on down. Always. Always. That's why it's wrong for the greater to start requiring charity of the lesser to cover his own lack of charity. Come on, that doesn't make any sense. That's just backwards and perverse. Anyway, so there you go. So the, the bond of perfectness, of perfectness is charity. Of course, the bond of uh, bitterness is the bond of iniquity. The gall of bitterness is the bond of iniquity. Charity is the bond of perfectness. See that you love one another, to have charity to one another with a pure heart fervently. It's the only thing that is going to get us through. And then let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? We'll come back to this. I'll read a scripture in Jeremiah 2 to illustrate it. 
And I guess that'll kind of close it out. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works, your labor, your patience. You can't bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and found them to be liars. And you've borne, you put up with things, you've borne, you know, you suffered affliction, persecution, slander, whatever. You've borne, you have patience. For my name's sake, you've labored, and you haven't fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or I will come unto thee quickly. Remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. That's where we're at. We hate it. We hate what we've seen. And rightfully so. Just you can't let it turn into a gall of bitterness. There's always a potential for that. But hey, that's the divine nature. Love, righteousness, and hate iniquity. Jeremiah chapter 2 illustrates this. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Go cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the firstfruits of all your increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. I said, I remember when you were first saved, when I first called you, and everything was Jesus, 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 holiness unto the Lord. I'm going after Jesus in the wilderness, in the world, in a land that was not sown. You didn't really have the knowledge of God, all the whole description of God's purpose in your heart. You were just a baby Christian. You just had the spirit, you had the zeal, you had the love, and that was all good, and that was all pure and everything else, but it was in a land not sown. It wasn't sown in your heart yet what, what the fullness of this purpose of God was all about, except you knew your sins are forgiven, you're getting saved, and all of that. Okay, but hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and have become vain. You see, there's a backsliding, a falling away after the first love. You know the parable of the uh, Good Samaritan. A man goes from Jerusalem to yeah. Jericho. Jerusalem is the holy city. Jericho is the evil city. That's where we went. We went from our purity of a, when we were first saved and we just let it all slip and we're trying to get all entangled from Jericho, that evil city, that walled city. So it's part of the way things are. So anyway, neither said they, you know, what iniquity have your fathers found in me that they've gone away? become vain. Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt and led us through the wilderness, through a land of desert and pits and a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt. And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land. You made my heritage an abomination. The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handled the law Knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, which comes from Balaam, and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Chittim and see, send unto Kedar and consider diligently if there be such a thing. Hath the nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? My people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. I read a lot of this the other week, I think. I'll just take some highlights out of it. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, down in verse 19. Thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see it's an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. For of old time I broke your yoke and burst your bands and you said, I will not transgress. Yet upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest playing the harlot. I planted you a noble vine, a right seed. How are you turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? For though thou wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked. How can, thou, how can you say I'm not polluted? I've not gone after Balaam. See your way in the valley. Know what you've done. A swift dromedary traversing her way, snuffing up the wind. Wild ass, snuff up the wind at your pleasure. In her occasion, who can turn her away? You know, where, when, whenever you want, at every pleasure, just snuff up the wind towards your lust. And who's going to stop you? Withhold your, yeah, withhold your foot from being unshod. 
you take a step in life, you take a step in, in your daily routine, you know, you're, you're, you're taking a step with your foot, you're not supposed to be unshot, unprepared. You're supposed to, and I'm not saying that you, you, you uh, get obsessive over this stuff, but hey, let's think about what we say and think about what we do and what will happen if I take this course, if I take that course. It's your, 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 your feet, if you just are impulsive and just snuff up the wind, and you, you, there's no preparation in your steps at all, no consideration. As a thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes, their prophets, their priests, saying to a stock, Thou art my father, and to a stone, Thou hast brought me forth. Now even though Paul said, Though you have 10,000 instructors, you have not many fathers, for I have begotten you through the gospel. There's no, there's no movement or unction or uh, encouragement for anyone to call him a father. Because Jesus says, call no man your father. Call no man your father. You have one father, your God which is in heaven. Now here's the thing. Paul says, yes, you have not many fathers, for I have begotten you. He's kind of saying that the Father has used me. Now you can, you can hear what Paul said, but you've got to put it together with Colossians. Hear what Paul says, and then hold the head. Hold the head. Yeah, God is my Father because of this man's calling and administration. But I'm not going to call him my Father. My Father's God. That's your reward. We're sons of God. I know, you can bring other things into it, like Timothy, my own son in the faith, and all of that. Maybe I'll deal with the whole father issue as a, as, as a whole message one day. But right now, there's something going on in the church that is a, a description of, of what Colossians says, a worshiping of angels. We've seen it, I'm not just saying in the context that we're in, in the overcomer, I'm just saying it's everywhere. It's, it's our whole Christian culture has come up, putting names on the ministries, everything else. Worshipping the creature more than the creator. Uh, giving honor to the ox. Making an ox golden. An ox isn't golden. An ox is just an ox. It eats grass and it, it, it passes away. Our, you know, Saying to a stock, thou art my father. To a stone, thou hast brought me forth. What they say in the golden calf. Oh, behold Israel. Here are the golden calves that brought you out of the land of Egypt. No, God brought, God brought you out. Alright. So you see the danger in that. It's taking the glory from God. Thou art my father. Saying to a stock, thou art my father, to a stone thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me and not their face. But in the time of the trouble they will say, O oh God, arise, save us. Where are your gods? Let them arise, if they can save you in the time of your trouble. See, God's getting upset. Yeah, you chose all the false gods, and you're in trouble? Huh, what you calling on me for? Calling your gods. Oh, but God, I'm, I'm miserable at these hotels. Oh, I can see God saying to me, Oh yeah? These hotels guys got you miserable? Call on them. Let them pay for your psychi psychiatrist so you can feel better. If I've neglected God, right? And I put it in reference to guys like Brother Stare and others. Oh yeah, yeah. You want, you, want, you want me to restore your marriage and your wife and everything else? Well... Go, go to your porn sites and your sex dating websites. Get them to foot to get them to uh, finance your marriage counseling. Let them save your marriage. Seeing you turn to them for years, turned your back on me. See what God's doing? He's putting it back in your face. Putting it back in your face to make a point. See if they can save you in the time of your trouble. According to the number of thy cities, are thy gods, O Judah? Wherefore will you plead with me? You've all transgressed against me. See, there is, there is a time to level the playing field. To say, yeah, we've all transgressed. We've all left the first love. In vain I have smitten your children. They receive no correction. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. O generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel, a land of darkness? Wherefore say my people, we are lords. We are independent. We will come no more unto thee. Can a maid forget her ornaments or bride of her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. So on and so on. Also in the skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. Shedding of innocent blood. Talk about Manasseh. That's what I forgot about King Manasseh last week. Is that King Manasseh from one end of the Jerusalem to another shed innocent blood. And it was so bad. It said he shed innocent blood until the Lord would not pardon it. So much innocent blood shed. 
But you say, I'm innocent. I haven't sinned. I have no lust. Whatever. I'm all right. No, I'm innocent. His anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead with you because you're saying I haven't sinned. Why gaddest thou about so much to change thy way? Thou also shalt be ashamed of Egypt as thou were ashamed of Assyria. Yea, thou shalt go forth from him and thine hand, hands upon thy head, for the Lord hath rejected thy confidences, and thou shalt not prosper in them. Right. In the fear of the Lord there's a strong confidence. Make no mistake about it. Everybody's fighting for some kind of clearness. And if you can't get clearness, then you'll strive for searedness, searedness, which is the counterfeit clearness, you know, seared conscience. And you'll try to hold this confidence based on your Nicolaitan false counsel doctrines that allow all this excessive amount of sin. And you'll, you'll put forth your confidence. But there is a confidence that's not in the fear of God sometimes. And God is saying, that kind of confidence, you're not going to prosper in that kind of confidence. Right? The righteous are as bold as a lion. Bold. Forthright. Intense, bold as a lion, sure of themselves, but the fool rages and is confident. So you're 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 exuding a confidence and trying to pass it off as a godly confidence related to faith. But if your conscience is seared and you're living like hell and everything else, well, that's it's it's a counterfeit. God, you won't prosper in that kind of a confidence. See, it's different kinds of confidences. There's different kinds of reasons why you're. Your conscience can exist in a state of uh, clearness or counterfeit clearness. Right. It's either cleared from God or it is seared. All right. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to. And this is what's at stake here. So I thought that was very, very revealing uh, that this stuff about the, the Nicolaitans. It really kind of fits in what's happened. All right, so yeah, we get back to the first love. And that's what Jeremiah 2 is. God is saying, hey, I remember you when you were Israel was holiness unto the Lord, when you were first saved. Back to Abraham Lincoln. A, um, a house divided against itself cannot stand. They attribute it to Abraham Lincoln, right? Because they, they're not holding the head. So people are attributing things to men of God and they're leaving the head out of it. You have to hold the head in everything that has anything to do with this operation of God. Always, always, always you have to bring it back to the source, the head. Always, always holding the head. If you don't, and especially the, the perilous generation we're in where things become so perverse so out of order, then inevitably it's going to fall out into a worshiping of angels. You change the glory of God and then you change it to the similitude of an ox that eats grass. Okay? We're not doing away with honor for men of God. We're not doing away with submission to authorities in the flesh. We're talking about the measure of things, the degree of things. And clearly... As you expound the scriptures, when we put all these principles together, you can see by the deeds that have gone on, where we came out of, clearly it fits this description that I brought tonight. Okay, that's it. I'm done. Praise the Lord. Bless you.